Hi, thank you so much for joining us for the Clifford Still Museum's first virtual film still program. Hopefully you were all able to view Lifeline Clifford Still. And now we have the chance to talk to the film's director, Dennis Scholl, and CSM director, Dean Sobel. My name is Nicole Cromarty, and I'm the Director of Education and Programs at the Clifford Still Museum. The Clifford Still Museum's archives and collection were an integral part of the film that you saw tonight. If you haven't had the opportunity to visit the museum, we encourage you to visit once the museum reopens to the public. The Clifford Still Museum offers nine beautiful galleries, which you saw in the film, of Still's art, historic photos, objects, and letters from the Clifford Still archives views into storage and conservation areas, an art studio, and a shop. The museum opened in 2011 uh, in the heart of Denver's Golden Triangle Creative Dis District and was designed specifically to display Clifford Still's art. The museum is home to nearly everything Clifford Still created, over 3,000 works of art, and that makes up 95% of his lifetime of work. Now I'd like to introduce Dennis Scholl, who is joining us from Miami tonight. Hello! Dennis Scholl is the president and CEO of Ulite Arts, formerly known as Art Center South Florida, a 35-year-old organization dedicated to supporting visual arts in Miami. He is also a collector of contemporary art, whose willingness to experiment and encourage artists and curators to push boundaries is well known in the art world. Over the last 20 years, Scholl created a series of initiatives dedicated to building the art collections of museums, including the Guggenheim, the Tate Modern, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, which resulted in hundreds of patron-funded acquisitions. Dennis is a 13-time regional Emmy winner for his work in cultural documentaries, including films about Tracy Emin, The Astor Gates, Wynton Marsalis, and Frank Gehry. His first feature documentary, Deep City, The Birth of Miami Sound, premiered at the 2014 South by Southwest Film Festival. He recently produced an animated short, The Sun as Big Dark Animal, The Sun as a Big Dark Animal, uh, which was an official selection of the 2015 Sundance International Film Festival. Scholl's second feature documentary, Queen of Thursdays, which he co-wrote and produced with noted Cuban filmmaker Orlando Rojas, had its world premiere at the Miami International Film Festival and was named Best Documentary. His current films include The Last Resort, now on Netflix, and Singular, now on public television. Dennis will be in conversation tonight with the Clifford Still Museum's director, Dean Sobel, and I will pass it over to Dean now. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Dennis for the great film, and it's good to see you. Thank you. Um, I th uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. If um, I hope you all had a chance to see the film streaming on Vimeo, but if for some reason you missed it or are joining us for the talk back, but you didn't see the film, we'll say something at the end on how you can um, stream it at another time. Um, I think you all know we, or would assume we had planned to do our screening in a movie theater, the good old days of movie theaters. And Dennis and I would have been together on the same stage or at least in uh, close proximity chairs. Um, but it's uh, great that we were still able to do this. The film actually premiered, world premiered, I think eight months ago, last fall or something. But because of um, rules for getting it into film festivals, um, it kind of blew up in a certain way. Um, some museums wanted to pick it up right away. And then of course in COVID, it became a very popular item in the streaming uh, market. The uh, Denver premiere got delayed. So it's really exciting to be able to screen this for our Denver friends and the many of you from other points around the country. Um, but Dennis, first off, would you just tell people where the film has been um, since fall, where it debuted, um, where you and Clifford and the film have been? Sure, the film uh, debuted in Mecca for documentaries, which is a doc NYC. And my last few films have debuted there, but it's a really great documentary film festival, the best in the country, frankly. From there, we scheduled a 50 museum tour, including tonight, which was, as you said, supposed to be a live uh, uh, event. And it was my chance to get out to Colorado. 
But after scheduling most of that tour, I got to do one screening in the parish in the East Hamptons. Um, and then the second screening was at my hometown museum, the Perez Art Museum, and it was scheduled for March 14th, which of course, as we know, the, the world shut down on March 13th. We quickly had to make a decision, do we wait this out or do we pivot and release the film on live uh, streaming? And we made the decision to release the film on streaming via my distributor's platform, uh, the famous Kino Lorber, a very well-known indie uh, film distributor. And so the film is now available on streaming on KinoNow.com. But recently I've done screenings with a number of other museums. This week already I did a big uh, screening with hundreds and hundreds of people for Sotheby's. They just happened to have a $35 million still painting up for auction uh, next week. And so they thought it might be a good time to show the film. So we did it with them. After you, the film will be seen at the Phoenix Art Museum. We're doing it at SF MoMA, lots and lots of places. Um, we're just all adapting to the new normal. And, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, if you can't be in the theater, you know, do you shut your film down or do you try to bring it to the people? Now, the beauty of what we're doing here is you've got folks from Canada on tonight watching the film. You've got folks from London. So it has allowed us to go and use this platform to go worldwide, which we're very excited about. Yeah, it has been terrific. It's, it was really fun to see the film again tonight. I hadn't seen it in some time and I keep making comparisons and new, new associations. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Kina Lorber, who you mentioned, who um, arranged for us to do this screening somewhat, um, I don't want to say last minute, but it wasn't the original plan, as you know. They've been very, very helpful. Um, also to our executive producers, Lanny and Sharon Martin, who have been very generous to this project. Our three archivists and curators, um, Jesse Dela Cruz, Ferret, uh, Kundif, uh, also Bailey Placek. Uh, you have probably 500 or more individual archival frames, and a lot of that was um, ferreted out from deep and dark uh, file folders and other places. Without, without them, I yeah, mean, they were so dedicated. I mean, you gave them the room to do it, but they were so dedicated to this process. And to have 12,000 personal photos to choose from, not even counting the photos of the art, really is what made the film happen. That and of course, the discovery midway of the, of the 34 hours of audio tape and the 28 minutes of videotape, which was a game changer for all of us. Yeah, it really does um, uh, tell the story, I think, in a way that none of us uh, certainly could have. Well, let's go, let's go to the very beginning. Um, what was your, what is your history with Clifford Still? Um, what led you to want to devote so much of your time or what turned out to be a lot of your time. This movie took longer than a lot of your films. And I know you're a very, um, how shall I say this nicely? You like to do things and move on to other projects, but this one lingered on for a bit. What, what is your history with Clifford Still? Well, you're right. It did take a lot longer than I'd hoped. It took five and a half years. Um, and um, during that time though, fortunately, I, I became a better documentary filmmaker. So we all won a, a little bit. Um, I did not grow up in a cultural household. I did not go to the ballet, the opera, the symphony, or ever a museum until I was 22 years old. And at 23, I went to the Met and I walked into the still room and I was simply gobsmacked by the majesty of these paintings, by how they consume you within the frame. There is really no frame. And, and I've never lost that, that awe of still's work. Um, that coupled with the fact one of my really, really good friends who I happened to work with in Aspen was the director of the Still Museum. That's you, Dean. Um, I think when I called you and I said to you, hey man, I wanna make a movie. You were a little circumspect because you hadn't seen anything I'd done or any, you know, any of the work that I had created. And uh, um, you were, hmm, I don't know about that. But I was committed from the very beginning. Still has always been my favorite artist. It, bar none, never changed that whole time. And it's a weird moment because I, I, I've been collecting art for 42 years and I'm never gonna own a Clifford Still. I mean, it's just not possible really. And, 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 and yet he has always taken me to a place that I don't go with any other artist. So when I began to, when I began, you were in charge of this incredible archive and you were in charge of all this work, 
and I felt like I might be able to approach you to have this conversation. Uh, I was very excited about it. Um, as you know, there had been a really beautiful film uh, made by Amy uh, at the opening of the museum. And if I couldn't do something different, I wouldn't have done it. You know, yeah. she did a very beautiful chronological story of Stills uh, beginning, middle and end. And uh, she did a really great job of showing you uh, when those paintings were being opened up for the first time in Maryland. But I felt like there was another film there that was a psychological study. And I hope that that's what we accomplished with this is, is to try to give the general public an understanding of Still as not just the, you know, curmudgeon guy. That's the easy, that's the easy fallout from, from uh, you know, the, uh, what people talk about him. So I felt like we could do something different and I hope we did. Were there other sort of guiding principles besides a kind of psychological, a more probing psychological study? Were there other things, a particular narrative, or do, does all that come through the process, the process of making it? Well, documentary films, you don't tell them what they're going to be. They tell you what they're going to be. And so uh, there's always a pivot and iteration and adjustment that takes place as you go through the film. But I think the thing I feared the most was the inability to deliver on his words. He is a guy that has had a ton of integrity. And that was his watchword, is that he felt like the integrity of his work was everything. And I really wanted to make sure that people understood how much he gave up just to preserve that integrity. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's in the tapes, it's in the video, it's in the archives, it's in the work. And so I, I really felt like we had an opportunity, and you and I spent a lot of time talking about this, to have him reconsidered as an artist. I firmly believe he's the greatest American painter of the 20th century. Pollock was a great painter. He had better press. Uh, Rothko was a great painter. Uh, he was more willing to deal with the press, still was not. And between stills not being willing to deal and Mrs. Still basically burying him for 20 something plus years, 25 years, um, it really took the luster off of his work. And the art world, of course, is a, work, is, is a world of comparisons. And if you have nothing to compare to, and that's what happened with Still, then you get written out of the history books. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, there, we, I've always felt leading the museum and working with Still that we were blessed with a really good story. I mean, there's a, another story for Jackson Pollock and a different story for Mark Rothko, which maybe aren't that different in some respects. Um, but the Still story is very rich and deep and merits, you know, more than one telling, I think, too. And I, I think uh, that's what's so special about your film. Um, I should mention to those in the um, uh, online that you can use the chat box to ask questions and then Nicole will uh, give us some questions in a little bit. We'll only go another 10 minutes or so and then uh, turn it over to your questions as well. Um, you mentioned we've talked we talked a lot about this film and one of the things I struggled with was this notion of Stills personality. Um, you know there are many stories and legends that surround him, um, his dealings with critics. You and I talked about whether or not we needed to mention the uh, somewhat legendary moment where he sends the the critic Emily Brenauer. Um, you wouldn't let me put that in the movie. <laughs> a pair of diapers. I'm not sure if they're baby diapers or uh, adult diapers, but I'm not sure that it matters so much. You know, the, there there are those great stories, but there's another side of still that I think is equally important as a filmmaker. Um, beyond you know whatever prodding I um, try to make. How do you balance that with a person that has, um, you know, probably more than two sides to him, I think? Yeah, I, I, you know, first and foremost, I wanted to bring him forward again so that people could reflect on him and his work but through the film. And I hope in some way we've accomplished that. You know, where the film has done really well is with the art world. We've been embraced by Art News, Artsy, uh, Art Forum, I mean, so many, uh, you know, hyper allergic, they've all really embraced the film and said, here's a guy that, um, you know, where the work was really special, but that the art world, it, when you decline to play in the art world, you, you know, you get forgotten. Yeah. And so I, I really felt like that was an important thing. And then the other idea was he loved his family. I mean, you know, it, it was a little bit unusual in the way that he dealt with them, but he loved his family. And you can see that in, in the videotape. You can see him playing ball with his uh, son-in-law, 
teaching his daughter how to shoot a, a shotgun. Uh, I mean, he really cared about his family. And when I did those interviews with Sandra and Diane, and uh, those were really intense, intense moments, um, it was clear that while they were in awe of their father, they also knew that he loved them. Yeah, yeah, and, and they speak of him in the highest regards, which probably at certain points of their life wasn't always so easy. Um, I think some of our viewers would, or possibly some of our viewers would agree with me that in addition to the archives, it's really Sandra and Diane, the two daughters who drive that narrative. I mean, they, they tonight I was reminded of, uh, you know, Sandra's remarks about her father's pictures that are on par with anybody, what anybody else in the film says about them. Um, and I knew that when I first met her, that she, uh, you know, probably like the children of plumbers, they can speak about uh, plumbing to the highest level and they grew up with it, that they speak in a language that's very familiar to their fathers, I think. I think Sandra is maybe the most interesting person in the film because if we'd never found the audio tapes, we still could have had a film through Sandra's voice. She literally channeled her father's positions, his reality, how he felt about the world. I mean, she sat down and we just pressed play. And the greatest thing as a documentarian is to get out of the way of your subject when the time comes, you know, without having to prod them. And we literally that day in the drawing room at the museum pressed play and she just went. And uh, she was spectacular in her, uh, analysis of what was going on. She understood exactly how he felt about the art market, um, you know. But, but the other linchpin in the film that we tried very hard uh, to work on is the idea of, of making him contemporary. And the way I wanted to do that is to reach out to all of the relationships that I have in the art world. You were very helpful with, with that. You have in the art world. And asking people like Julian Schnabel, uh, Mark Bradford, Julie Moretti, uh, uh, you know, people like that to say, well, what does still mean to you? And it was astounding how important still, both for the work, but also for the stand that he took in the art world was to these artists who have been blessed with, you know, the greatest moments the art world can bring you, um, but still being careful about the machine. And, uh, you know, that was an important thing to try to contemporize him. I do think there's instances where artists since still have had their own, let's just first of all agree, troubled relationship with the art world or parts of the art world. And even those that are literally fiercely opposed to it, Katie Nolan comes to mind as one. Perfect recent, example. Yeah, good example. But no one I think had decided so early in their career and stuck to it as long and was so convinced of what he needed to do for his own work than, than Clifford Still. I think <clears throat> that certainly comes through in the, the movie as well. Think about what he gave up. I mean, this is a guy that turned down the Venice Biennale yeah. at least twice and maybe three times. Yeah. Um, who does that? I mean, <laughs> you get offered Venice Biennale as an American, in, in that beautiful uh, Jeffersonian American pavilion. How do you say no once, nonetheless three times? Yeah. So he absolutely stood by, stood his ground. He absolutely felt that um, he had to do this for the work. It was all about the work. And of course, the other thing you guys have done with your shows is I think often of that great replica show where Still would sell a painting in order to you know pay his bills. And then he would be lamenting it and he would say, I, I can't believe I sold that painting. Yeah. I'm going to make one kind of like it. And they're not identical. I mean, Ellsworth Kelly made a lot of, you know, big, big black squares. Um, and he would make another painting because he really felt like he had something that was, you know, complete. Sandra says it best. She says, it's an opera. And there are these paintings that are arias. And he would sell an aria and freak out and say, I can't do that. I got to make another one. Exactly. So, I, you know, he really did... Um, he really did not want to let go of anything. And that, and that was, you know, a big issue. He, he was a collector of his own work, I think, in that respect. And, and like a, a, a patchwork or uh, the notion that the, the collection is really a single statement, the idea that he needed a lot of those parts to make the complete statement and those replicas figured into that. Um, hey, Nicole, if you're out there, are there any burning questions uh, just to shift the conversation a little bit? Yeah, we do. We do have a few questions. Um, I want to start with uh, one from Aaron in Florida. 
She asked, do you think that agreeing to not show any other artist at the Clifford Still Museum limits the story you can tell about the great impact and influence Still had on so many other artists' work? Dean, I think that's a question for you first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's no question um, that you, you, know, certain, you gain certain things by letting other uh, people play in the sandbox. But I think you also, you know, you lose certain things in, in, the, in the same point. And, you know, we knew from the very beginning what the terms of the agreement were, that it would be only still in those galleries. We've done, I think, a pretty good job of, of at least in the galleries, using reproductions or technologies, um, other artists and other people talking about the work, of course. And then in publications and in other museums, we lent pictures to uh, London and Bilbao, Spain in 2016, 17. So, you know, it, it isn't as though I personally, or I think anyone at the museum feels like we're that strapped. It's uh, all museums work within certain um, strictures or certain categories, and we're just a little more limited. Dennis, but, what do you think? But, but, but Dean, in, in, in today's art world, it's, I mean, it's clearly an issue. Um, the context is key. Yeah. One of the things you've done really beautifully is work with your uh, with your neighbor to you know so that people can walk thirty five steps and and get the context that they need. But context is key, and Jerry Saltz is brilliant in the film. I I literally did fifteen minutes with Jerry, and I wound up using like six of them because he was so great. And uh, you you know he understands the art world. He understands how it works. And these single artist museums, they are possible but they may not necessarily be always the best thing for the artist's reputation. In this case, you guys have managed it really well and you've been able to contextualize the work many, many different ways, bringing in uh, younger artists to, to create shows. Uh, there's lots of things that you've done to make it work, uh, but, but it's, it makes it certainly more difficult. And you've also got to convince the public, I mean, I've probably been to the museum 30 times, but you've got to convince the public that it's always there. There's something almost religious about the experience and you need to come back over and over and over again. Yeah, it, it is, um, you know, it's wor worth mentioning too, there are lots of stills and lots of other institutions, probably more so than people realize, uh, you know, in, into the hundreds actually that aren't in Denver. But there's always something odd about still and, you know, the build up to the opening of the museum that I think he will always seem somewhat removed and you know his work will be difficult to see um you know unless you live in colorado i, I suppose um nicole any other questions yeah we have another one about uh how did still manage to survive financially after rejecting the art world that comes from lane yeah, yeah that's a very common yeah. question it's a complete myth that he didn't sell um he sold when he wanted to sell so i think we have been part of what might be a number of uh, mythologies are perpetuating certain uh, aspects of Stills' uh, real dealings with the art world, but he did sell. He would get 100% of the proceeds, not having to share it with the dealer after roughly the mid-50s. Um, and his work always went up in value, which is something that only a few artists enjoy, that, you know, the paintings, he could sell fewer and fewer of them by the end of his life because the value um, kept going up. One of the great things about uh, doing the research was going into the archive and finding Mrs. Still's monthly budget uh, uh -huh. uh, seven column paper. I mean, she literally tracked the dollars to the penny. Yeah. And it wasn't like they didn't have money because the dude was never without a new Jaguar. Right. Uh, he was a car guy and he loved cars. And so he would sell work. Um, and that's always a surprise to people, I think. I, pe I think people think they lived you know, hand to mouth. It wasn't about that. He sold a very limited amount of work. I think the number, the total number is like 180, you know, less than 5% of the work. Well, gave um, away. Yeah, I, and that would be things he gave away, but that's a good number. Yeah. yeah. And I, and, and uh, looking at that budget uh, thing, I, I'm a former CPA, so I was very into that. And watching her write down about how much they spent on milk and how much they spent on gasoline and things like that. I mean, it was a very, very modest lifestyle. Um, uh, and it was only because he didn't want to let go of work. He could have had all the riches in the world with Marlboro and, and uh, the other galleries. So, you know, that was pretty interesting when we were doing that research to find those columns and to literally be able to film them and show what was going on. 
Yeah, I think I think they had enough money that they didn't have to worry about it then or later, but it wasn't so much to the degree that money changes people um, to various degrees at various moments. So they were very skilled at, you know, sort of navigating all those dualities about what was going to work for them. And I, I think they did a terrific job. Um, yeah. Nicole, anything else? Yeah, we have our next question is from Chantal and it's really for Dennis. How did you make the decision to omit the bulk of his early or figurative work from the film? Yeah, well, it, it, that was a really difficult decision. I, I thought Amy's film did a very good job of covering that and I didn't want to retread that ground. And for me, there were a handful of early paintings that I thought were absolutely seminal and important. The shucking of the wheat painting with the blood running down the arms, I thought was uh, covered a decade of his work in just that one painting and the description of it. Um, so it, 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 it was a moment of, uh, uh, I didn't feel like I, the audience needed to go on that journey of showing uh, 1931, 1936, 1940, 1945, and then of course, you know, when it all got rock and roll in 44 to 47. So uh, we made the conscious decision early that we weren't gonna do a chronological film, that we were gonna do a film that was more of a study of him. And uh, by the way, before we go to the next question, I wanna give a couple of shout outs, uh, Lanny and Sharon, if you're watching, thank you so much, this film doesn't happen. Uh, without you. Uh, my buddy Gary Stoyer is watching, I know, and uh, uh, he's a very important part of this too. And uh, uh, one of my board members in Miami, Lilia Garcia, thank you for watching. We appreciate it. Great. Um, any other questions, Nicole? Yeah, I think we have time for one more. We've actually got a couple questions about Pollock. Um, the question is, I would love to know why you think still maintained his relationship with Pollock since Pollock had the reputation of being such a difficult person. Wow. So I, I, I'll speak to that one first. Um, as David Anfam says in the film, he never fell out with Pollock. Why? Because Pollock was just as tortured about this as he was. And um, he truly believed Pollock was a great painter. I, I, I think that that is clear on his face. And I, I think he didn't feel that Pollock sold out, unlike the way he felt about Rothko, certainly Newman, who he was you know, not crazy about, even Motherwell to some extent. He truly felt that Pollock was a great painter and was in it for the, in Stills, you know, theory, the right reasons. And, um, I think that that's why he always kept his uh, relationship with Jackson Pollock. And uh, uh, Dean, what do you think? You know, it, it is an interesting and a very, very good question. Um, certainly, Still and Pollock were most friendly in the, in the middle 50s. Pollock dies in 1956, but uh, by that point, Still could continue that relationship because Pollock wasn't so connected to everyone else too, for a variety of reasons. He, you know, had fallings out of his own. But I think by that point, uh, certainly around the last few years of Pollock's life, by the mid 50s, all those artists were somewhat more independent. That, that notion that you band together on the way up, but certainly when you get that success, you do find yourself more and more, for a variety of reasons again, probably as individuals. And I think those two individuals really had a lot to talk about and um, a, lot to, a lot of common ground at a certain point. Uh, we're already on a half hour. Nicole, should we take one more or should we uh, wrap it up? I think we might wrap it up, Dean. Okay. Dennis, will you say something about for those who weren't able to see the film, um, in addition to Kino Now, the streaming service of the distributor Kino Lorber, I know it's on some of the other really popular uh, streaming platforms. Can you just review some of those? Yeah, KinoNow.com. Uh, you can find us on the Apple uh, you know, movie streaming. Uh, most any of those big streaming services, the film is out there now. Uh, oh, yeah. It was a very difficult decision to make uh, because of the opportunity to hopefully do, we were hoping to do a year long museum run, but at this point, you know, given where we are, we felt like given the wonderful, wonderful uh, art press we've received, that we just had to put it out there for people to see it for nights like this. So thank you guys so much for uh, taking the time to show the film and uh, a really great audience night. Lots and lots of folks too, who have signed on. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Thanks, Dennis, particularly. Thanks, everybody. Um, we hope to see you at the galleries. Uh, stay tuned tomorrow when we make an announcement about our much anticipated reopening. Uh, so stay safe and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye -bye.
Thanks so much, Dennis and Dean, and thank you all for participating in this program. If you'd like to share this conversation, a recording will be available on the Clifford Still Museum's YouTube page in a couple of days. And as they said, if you'd like to share the film with folks, um, you can find that streaming on Kino now.